Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is chapter one, but part three of chapter one. Chapter one is called Dissecting a Laboring Party, or a Laboring Body, sorry, Frankenstein, Political Anatomy, and the Rise of Capitalism. And again, part three. Mar Monsters of Rebellion. While the poor found the market economy and its agents monstrous, the ruling class, as we have seen, perceived monstrosity in the mob. Within, closing, within closure and the rise of capitalist farming forcing people off the land or onto the margins of forests and wastes, growing legions of masterless women and men crisscrossed the English landscape. A veritable army of forest squatters, itinerant craftsmen, and building laborers, unemployed men and women seeking work, strolling players, minstrels and jugglers, quack doctors, gypsies, vagabonds, tramps, prowled the country, answering to neither lord nor master. Severed from the social order of the village economy, they were also disconnected from the regulatory gaze of their betters. Eschewing the disciplines of re of regularized wage labor and the established church, they fended for themselves in matters of body and soul, establishing dissenting congregations in makeshift communities. Throughout the country, hordes of homeless people set up camps wherever they could, in fields and farm buildings, in city streets and suburban ho hovels, even on the doorsteps of parliament and the monarch's court. England's governors were filled with horror and revul revulsion at the sight of these battalions of vagrants. Statute after statute was drawn up to regulate, whip, brand, and jail them. Discussing the authorities' obsession with vagrancy, R. H. Taney observed that the 16th century lived in terror of the tramp. And the terror persisted into subsequent centuries. Witness the 28 statutes passed between 1700 and 1824 in an effort to classify and punish a growing body of practices defined as vagrancy. The horror of the property classes was fueled in large measure by the persistent waves of anti-enclosure protest and food rioting that swept England during the rise of capitalism. The hatred of the poor for the rich may indeed have been more intense during this period of English history than at any other, and nothing inflamed the downtrodden more than the spatial aspects of society's transformation, the growing propensity of the rich to keep them out of common lands and open fields, to hem them in, to enclose and imprison them. By the 18th century, if not earlier, fences, hedges, jails, locks, and keys had become decisive symbols of capitalist order and dissection a preeminent image of bourgeois domination. Yet these technologies of the grotesque had their counterparts in the anxious horrors of the elites concerning the violent antipathy of the plebes for their rulers. Lurking within the interstices of polite society, the ruling class perceived a new created race of masterless men of beggars and vagabonds wandering the roads, homesteading on the dwindling common wastes, poaching and fence-breaking at will, a monstrous mob every, ever ready to transgress boundaries and overturn order, property, and civilization. Here again we encounter the early modern secularization of monstrosity, as monsters step forward not as bizarre creatures from other realms, but as disturbing humans who threaten lives, customary obligations, and social order. To be sure, this secular grotesque maintained continuities with older monstrous genres. Early modern images of monstrosity frequently drew on medieval representations of unsettling hybrids, strange combinations of body parts from different species, human bits conjoined to those of dogs, horses, or pigs, or on images of corporal distortion, such as multiple heads and oversized limbs or body parts. Imagery based on the Book of Revelations also loomed large in both medieval and early modern accounts of monsters in Europe. 
social geographical foreigners might be pathologized and monstrized in these terms, as Africans and the Irish frequently were. But monstrosity could also be located closer to home, attributed to neighbors and kin whose social behavior was deemed aberrant, aberrant, particularly those who, through their dress, behavior, and comportment, blurred class and gender differences. Notwithstanding such continuities, the secularized monsters of the early modern period were unique in three, in three respects. First, they were clearly human, not non-human in nature, however deviant and disturbing their behavior. Secondly, whereas medieval monsters were largely interpreted in theological terms as created by God in order to warn or punish humankind, secularized monsters were human creations, symptoms of degenerate social action and relations. Third, corporal distortion and abnormality were no longer essential to their being. Social behavior became the prime index of monstrosity, not bodily form. The new discourse of monstrosity owed something to the scientific orientation of the European Renaissance, which produced studies of monsters as indicators of the mar marvelous diversity of nature. It also owed something to a popular tradition of the comic grotesque, in which creatures composed of improbable and oversized conjugations of parts and species provoked laughter more than honor. In both of these scientific and popular genres, Rather than inducing fear and horror, monsters exercised an aesthetic and scientific fascination. They were widely displayed in public exhibitions where they could be viewed for a small fee, and in death, their skeletons or skulls filled the cabinets of curiosities assembled by wealthy patrons of the sciences. But perhaps the most important cause of the new secular discourse of monstrosity was its reshaping as an idiom for expressing the teeming social tensions that emerged in Tudor England with enclosure and the rise of agrarian capitalism. From the 1570s on, in response to these tensions, a shift appeared within the rhetoric of monstrosity, as Tudor commentators reworked it to describe horrifying attitudes and practices, from greed and enclosure on the one side to riot and treason on the other. Incarnated in frightful behavior more than grotesque bodies, monstrosity was now less visible, more obscure. Its cryptic signs had to be deciphered and explained, lest its socially destructive tendencies should undermine society itself. Rather than individual bodies, it was the body politic that was now at risk of becoming grotesque, headless or multi-headed in the fearful images of conservatives, rapacious or cannibalistic in the eyes of radicals and reformers. One intimation of this new rhetoric can be found in a fascinating document of the late 1590s, Luke Hutton's The Black Dog of Newgate. A convicted highwayman, Hutton, had been condemned to Newgate prison and there wrote his text. Subtitled, Or the Discovery of a London Monster, the Black Dog of Newgate is a harrowing tale of a monstrous human who appears to have been responsible for Hutton's capture and arrest. While, li while likened to a black dog, it is clear that Hutton's monster, and he repeatedly uses this word, bears no visible markings. Indeed, an angel advises him, Hutton be bold, for thou shalt see and hear men devils, devils men, one both, all deluding. The devils to be feared are thus humans, Englishmen in fact, who deceive and oppress the poor. Bribery his hand, spoil of the poor his trade, says Hutton to describe his horrible creature. Although his monster is said to transform from human to animal and back, Hutton offers no description of physical abnormalities, no physion physiognomy of the grotesque. The horror lies in social behavior, entrapment, deceit, bribery, extortion, and oppression, not corporal form. We hear the secular version of monstrosity echoing here, now worked into a plebeian idiom of revulsion against prisons and confinement. The multiple strands of the early modern discourse of monstrosity find no more sensitive registrar than Shakespeare, Shakespeare 
as did Rebelis, Shakespeare interweaved popular speech, speech genres and belief systems with classic literary sources to produce a new polyphonic language of immense artistic power. His grammar of monstrosity typically draws on popular idioms, though primarily in a secular vein to portray fractures in human social relations. In Richard III, this involves figuring corrupt political aspirations as corporal distortion, as corruption of individual physiognomy, while in Othello, typical European monsterizations of Africans are ambiguously mobilized to highlight the horrifying dimensions of envy and resentment. In much of the playwright's usage, monstrosity is a moral defect emanating from violations of kinship. In King Lear, for instance, Cordelia's ostensible lack of love for her father is described as monstrous, while Edgar is named a monster for his apparent betrayal of his father and of the natural obligations that ought to obtain, obtain among people in a well-ordered hierarchical society. Not infrequently, Shakespeare uses the term to signify excessive appetites for personal pleasure and gain, desires that break the bonds of reciprocity. Monstrosity thus takes the form of ruptures in social convention and obligation induced by unbridled individualism. In this vein, Shakespearean characters denounce monstrous envy and monstrous lust, monstrous arrogance and monster ingratitude. Perhaps no emotion figures more ominously than jealousy, which the poet describes in Othello as the green-eyed monster. Shakespeare also deploys political meanings of monstrosity, extending their reach from the realm of familial obligation into that of the body politic. Deploying a patriarchal model of political obligation, Shakespeare depicts kings as fathers of their people. For commoners to rebel is, therefore, to behave like Lear's ostensibly ungrateful daughter, to transgress proper relations between father and child, ruler and ruled. In Cori Cori oh fuck, I hate this one. In Coriolanus, we are instructed, for example, that ingratitude is monstrous, and for the multitude to be ungrateful were to make a monster of the multitude. Yet Shakespeare is no simple apologist for patriarchal power. The king and nobility have obligations too, to protect their dependents, to rule justly, to listen to the pleas of the poor, to eschew faction and intrigue in the interests of the commonwealth. Great realist that he is, Shakespeare well knows that the aristocracy frequently betrays these obligations. And when they do so, they have only themselves to blame for the tumult that ensues. While this is not a justification of pop popular rebellion, it does allow us to sympathize with its participants. Take, for example, what is perhaps Shakespeare's most interesting history play in this regard, Henry VI, Part II, often indicated as Henry, or to Henry IV, or fuck, to Henry VI, probably first performed in 1590, and in which we encounter contending secular versions of monstrosity. The play traces the short-lived success and ultimate failure of a major uprising of the people, modeled significantly on the English Peasants' Rebellion of 1381, which transpires in the midst of intrigue, faction, and murder among the aristocracy, as well as a rebellion in Ireland. Commentators have disagreed sharply about this play, reading it as both a mockery of the popular rebellion led by Jack Cade and as a declaration of sympathy for the rebels. Arguably, it is both of these, a sympathetic portrayal of the restive commons that nonetheless dismisses the egalitarianism of the rebels, urging the lower orders to leave the business of ruling to those properly qualified, the patriotic aristocracy and upper gentry. Yet Shakespeare exhorts these elites to behave virtuously as publicly spirited individuals or citizens, not rapacious accumulators of property and power. Indeed, a crucial part of the Shakespearean message seems to be that plebeian rebels mi mimic the factional behavior of their natural rulers, 
If revolt is to be quelled, then England's rulers must eschew individualism and factionalism and unite for the Commonwealth. Depicting the intense dynamics of social conflict, Shakespeare's language carries a high voltage charge. Ruling class attitudes toward the common people fairly pulsate with disgust. Members of the elite denounce the plebeians as the giddy multitude. An angry hive of bees, the rude multitude, rebellious hinds, the filth and scum of Kent and the rascal people. But if Shakespeare gives such sentiments their due, he equally lends voice to the sufferings of the common sort and their pleas for justice. He portrays a rebellion led by clothiers, tanners, butchers, and weavers, the very sorts who were found in the van of riots throughout England's cities and towns, as well as in the crowd that would surely have made its way to the theater. The poet also sympathetically highlights the hardships endured by rebel leader Cade, which would have been familiar to many of the common people. We are informed that Cade was born homeless, under a hedge, abused by the authorities, whipped three market days together, probably for begging, and maimed in defense of property, burnt I thee hand for stealing of sheep. Moreover, once the rebellion is crushed and Cade escapes, one of his comrades succinctly expresses the dilemma confronting a poor insurgent. Alas, he hath the no he hath no home, no place to fly to. A dilemma to which the poet returns in King Lear. But more than this, although occasionally laced with mockery, Shakespeare provides a fair description of the political sentiments of the insurrectionary commons. All the realms shall be in common, there shall be no money, the jails shall be broken out open in order to let out all the prisoners, ancient freedom shall be recovered. Still, because rebellion cannot ultimately be countenanced, the rebel must die if the wound in the body politic is to be healed, and the form of that death is surely instructive. Escaping to Kent, Cade scales a brick wall and enters the garden of Alexander Iden, a Kentish gentleman. Having gone five days without a morsel of bread, the staple food of the poor, the intruder hopes to eat grass or pick a salad. Instead, he is confronted by Aiden in the company of his servants. A battle ensues over the rights of property, which has been at the very heart of the struggle between commons and rulers throughout the play. The landowner's outrage vibrates with the poetics of enclosure. He denounces Cade's attempt to break into my garden and describes him as a thief come to rob my grounds, climbing my walls in spite of me, the owner. Overcome by hunger and fatigue, Cade is no match for the well-fed gentleman and dies at his hands. Then, in a series of acts that symbolically restore the order of property, Iden mutil mutilates Cade's remains, decapitates him, buries his headless corpse in a dunghill, and presents the rebel's head as a trophy to the king. The fissure in the social order is dramatically healed by mutilating, dissecting, and confining the rebel body. So while depicting the monstrous suffering, homelessness, whipping, and branding that foments rebellion, Shakespeare nevertheless holds that the greater monstrosity of rebellion must be slain. Fittingly, upon learning it is Cade that he is killed, Iden denounces him as that monstrous traitor. Nevertheless, Henry Henry the Sixth too is exceptional and its brilliant depiction of the overarching social conflict in early modern England, the struggle between common rights and the claims of private property. The play dramatically pits the rebel for whom all the realms shall be in common against a landowner defending his property from the depredations of a thief come to rob my grounds. With his acute sense of the transformations of his age, Shakespeare portrays Cade's rebellion as a contestation between the communal and the enclosed. He also vividly grasps the symbolic registers in which these conflicts are lived. Whereas Cade's crimes involve breaking into gardens and climbing walls, spatial transgressions that make possible theft against duly constituted property, the restoration of order is achieved by mutilating and dissecting the rebel body.
That body, one that, having been whipped and branded, bears the marks of the new order of property, is punished with dissection and enclosure. And in enclosing he who violated enclosure, the class and spatial boundaries of private property are reaffirmed and social order monstrously restored. Fifteen years later, Shakespeare returned to the issue of homelessness and within a year or two more to the problem of popular rebellion. Homelessness, as we have seen, was no mere literary conceit. Waves of enclosures, particularly in the English Midlands, had swept hundreds of thousands of people into poverty, homelessness, and vagrancy. Popular discontent was mounting, be it in anti-enclosure riots or petitions to authorities. In 1604, for instance, the people of Northamptonshire, not far from Shakespeare's hometown of Stratford, petitioned the House of Commons to intervene against enclosure and depopulation of the area. It is hard to imagine that Shakespeare could have been unaware of these developments. Indeed, literary evidence suggests he was far from unmoved by them. King Lear, for instance, his magnificent tragedy of 1605, contains some of the most profound and stirring commentaries on homelessness ever committed to paper. As a powerful storm whips up, the old and tortured Lear meditates on the plight of the dispossessed. Poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I have taken too little care of this. Take physic, pomp, expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, that thou mayst shake the su superflux to them and show the heavens more just. This call for a more just society in which the rich share their surpluses, the superflux, with poor naked wretches certainly did not express any sort of insurrectionary sentiment. It nonetheless conveyed deep sympathy with the victims of displacement and poverty. Part of Shakespeare's agenda thus seems to have involved moral reform of the ruling class, an injunction to more fairly share the wealth so that each man have enough. Bonds of reciprocity could be restored and tumult avoided if only the rich would resume their traditional obligations to the poor. By restoring the poor to the protection of their masters, hunger, resentment, and class conflict would be alleviated. But less than two years after the writing of King Lear, the hardships of enclosure, dearth, and hunger combined to stoke a mass upheaval throughout the Midlands, one of whose centres was Shakespeare's own country of Warwickshire. The largest plebeian uprising in nearly half a century, the Midland Revolt of May to June 1607, saw thousands of peasants and rural poor, many of them armed, gather in encampments with the intent to tear down enclosures. But the wealthy were not interested in repairing the bonds of reciprocity, rallying instead in defense of the rights of property and quickly arming their, re their retainers. They responded with unrelenting violence. Up to 50 poor rebels were killed in the fighting, while others were publicly hanged, drawn, and quartered in market towns throughout the offending region. Shakespeare appears to have been well informed about these events. He sought out a copy of the manifesto produced by the so-called Warwickshire diggers to justify their cause, and its echoes can be found in the memorable opening scenes of the play he wrote that year, Coriolanus. <laughs> Alone among Shakespeare's texts, Corio Coriolanus, I am positive I'm mispronouncing this, opens with a plebeian riot, and the crowd remains a central actor throughout the play. Equally compelling images of body parts and tropes of dismemberment dominate the script, and the convergence of these elements, plebeian revolt, body images, tropes of dismemberment, is electric. It is possible that Shakespeare's personal exposure to the theatre of dissection played some role here. He lived for some time no more than 50 yards from the Barber's Surgeon's Hall in London, where, as we have seen, public anatomies on convict corpses were performed four times a year. But it is equally likely that he drew such imagery from his extraordinary ear for the popular vernacular. Whatever the case, Cor Cor Coriolanus, 
is exceptional for the way it deploys the body as the central motif for divining the dynamics of popular rebellion. The play explores the mutual hatred between the Roman crowd, racked by hunger, and Caius Marcus, later dubbed Coriolanus, at the time the Republic's greatest military leader. This dialectic of hostility is corporally inscribed and enacted. At the most immediate level, it involves the mobilization of discourses of the body. While Coriolanus's rhetoric of contempt for the poor is predictable, he demeans them as curs, rabble, rats, herd, monster, barbarians, and as animated by fires of the lowest hell, it is distinguished by persistent comparison of the people to parts, wounds, or diseases of the body. Across the text, he describes the plebeians as scabs, measles, tongues, the beast with many heads, or as rotting cor corpses, the dead carcasses of unburied dead. As if rehearsing the political anatomy of Shakespeare's day, Coriolanus threatens to tear the rebels' bodies apart, vowing to pluck out the multitudinous tongue and warning one of the tribunes of the people that he will shake thy bones out of thy garments. In a remarkable image resonant with the politics of punitive anatomy, he lambasts the crowd as you fragments. Yet, while the military leader threatens the crowd with dissection, Shakespeare warns that the people too can partake in this game. Indeed, the play revolves around contending politics of dissection as part of its competing imageries of the body. And in the end, it is the great military leader himself who is torn apart torn apart by the crowd. But before analyzing those later scenes, let us explore Act 1, Scene 1 of the play, which so fascinated Bertolt Brecht. Alone among Shakespeare's plays, Coriolanus opens with a popular uprising. The cause is hunger. The rebels are resolved rather to die than to famish. More than this, and contrary to many later interpretations, the rebels are politically articulate. Analyzing the causes of their hunger, one of the insurgents offers a political economy of class exploitation. First citizen. We are accounted poor citizens. Their patricians good. What authority surfeits on would relieve us. The leanness that afflicts us, the object of our misery, is an inventory to particularize their abundance. Our sufferance is a gain to them. Let us revenge this with our pikes, ere we become rakes. For the gods know I speak this in hunger for bread, not in thirst for revenge. This is not a rational mob, a rabble intent on mere destruction. A rebellion of the belly it may be, to use a term that would soon be coined by Francis Bacon. But its participants comprise an articulate group of commoners, united against hunger and capable of strategic action, to lower the price of grain. They have analyzed their situation. They have identified those who oppose their demands. They have developed a rudimentary class analysis expressed in the first citizen's declaration that our sufferance is a gain to them. These thinking rebels of the belly are soon confronted by a parable of the body politic that is meant to disarm them. Arriving at the scene of the insurgency, patrician Menenius Agrippa endeavors to quell the uprising with a fable of the body and its members. In hopes of persuading them that the patricians are not to blame for their hunger, Menenius informs the insurgents that the nobility are, are like the belly of the body. While ingesting food, they simultaneously distribute its nutrients to all the limbs and organs of the body. Consequently, for the poor, the body's members to rebel against the patricians, the belly, is to threaten the very organ that nourishes them. In Plutarch's account, which Shakespeare had been reading prior to writing Coriolanus, this fable of the body politic placates the rebels. Yet, as some commentators have noted, Shakespeare's reworking destabilizes the parable, rendering it, rendering it considerably less effective. After all, this is a rebellion of the belly, and, as one commentator has observed of Menenius's story, in Shakespeare's version, its claim is inept, food is clearly and literally not being distributed, and the people, not the patricians, have to make do with the brain, or with the bran, 
In short, there are contested politics of the body at work here. Plebeian claims of the belly challenge a patrician fable of the belly. He's a disease that must be cut away, one of the people's tribunes declares of Coriolanus, not so subtly turning their adversary's own dissecting rhetoric against him. But as we have seen, it is bodies that are at stake in this contest, not just rhetorics. And so the great military leader who sought to cow a tribune by threatening to shake thy bones out of thy garments, discovers that what will be scattered are his own bones. Tear him to pieces, cries the crowd in the play's final scene, turning the English ruling class's favor, favored terror tactic against a member of the nobility. Where a plebeian rebel, Jack Cade, suffered the indignity of dissection in Henry the Sixth, too, in Coriolanus, such is the fate of a sneering member of the ruling class. Shakespeare thus creates here a compelling dialectic of monstrosity. By failing to heed the plight of the poor, the hungry, and the homeless, England's rulers, like Coriolanus, risk creating a rebel monster that will turn the world upside down by using the methods of political anatomy against the rich. As we shall see below, a similar dialectic of monstrosity emerges in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But for the moment, let us continue to explore the linguistic ferocity of the ruling class toward the multitude, which, if anything, Shakespeare may have understated. In Philip Sidney's Arcadia, the people are the many-headed multitude, or the mad multitude, which appears both elementally vicious, like enraged beasts, like a violent flood, and utterly stupid, as if an unruly sort of clowns. As we move toward the tumult of the English Civil War of the 1640s, two themes come to dominate the construction of the monstrous crowd. First, the multitude is portrayed as a headless beast, one that has lost its mind as represented by the monarch, or what is meant as the same thing as many-headed, a reference to its democratic proclivity for rule by the many. In addition, the mob is said, secondly, to consist of a monstrous confusion of parts, detached bits lacking order and form. Having broken up the body politic by rebelling, the rabble cannot reconstitute an organic whole. Instead, it comprises a monstrous assemblage of disorderly frag fragments of humanity. For Sir Thomas Brown in 1642, the multitude encompassed that numerous piece of monstrosity, which, confused together, make but one great beast. This confusion was regularly figured in images of spatial transgression of overflowing of boundaries. An enclosure was enlisted as the great restorer of boundaries, order, property, and authority. Anarchical confusions and fearful cal calamities await us, urged James Howell in 1642. Unless with the pious care which is already taken to hinder the great beast to break into the vineyard, there be also a speedy course taken to fence her from other vermin and lesser animals. Without such fences, the many-headed monster was sure to lay England open to waste, spoil, and scorn. Perhaps no scholar devoted so much attention to the many-headed monster as did Francis Bacon. Much of the motivation here was political, both domestic, to tame the unruly English mob, and colonial, to justify foreign conquest. As Linbaugh and Redeker point out in his effort at a comprehensive account of monstrosity, Bacon enumerated a series of multitudes whose destruction was recommended. West Indians, dispossessed commoners, pirates, land rovers, um, such as squatters, itinerant laborers, and highwaymen, assassins, Amazons, almost certainly a reference to rebel women who led food riots and anti-enclosure riots, and Anabapt Anabaptists, who were widely presumed to favor common ownership of all property. We find in Bacon the whole project of political anatomy a plan for empire based first on the extermination of the monsters of, of the colonial world and the expropriation, mapping and particularization of their lands and resources. And 
second, a proposal for war against the rebellious monsters infecting the English body politic. Commoners, squatters, riotous women, agrarian communists. Gender, class, race, and colonialism all intersect in this early modern anatomy of monstrosity. Riotous women, pirates, masterless commoners, communists, and West Indians all comprise people of the belly, and Bacon intimates as much when in his essay on sedition, he declaims that the rebellions of the belly are worst. If the discourse of monstrosity reached a fever pitch during the English Civil War, it was in the 18th century that the rhetoric of dissection came to dominate it. Cromwell, of course, had famously pledged to dismember the radical mass movement of the 1640s, the Levellers, enjoining that you have no way to deal with these men but to break them to pieces. But it was during the next century that dissection emerged as the central trope of calls for the elimination of riot and disorder. As anatomy became ever more intimately a part of the practice of criminal justice in England, calls to cut off the offending members of the body politic gained wide currency. The corrupt members of the community must be cut off by the sword of justice, implored Samuel Moody in 1737. Three years earlier, George Osborne had likewise opined that magistrates possessed the right to cut off the vicious members of society. Writing in 1742, Samuel Russell urged that the, poison, poison, that the poisonous example offered by criminals be eliminated by cutting them off by the hand of justice. And in the next decade, Joshua Fitzsimmons could be found exercising the same metaphor. The infected limb must be cut off, he declared. But the episode that most alarmed the ruling class during this century was the Gordon Riots of June 1780 when buildings blazed and the prisons were thrown open by the London crowd. Over 100 houses were leveled or seriously damaged. Parliament and the Bank of England were attacked. Up to 500 people killed, mainly by troops firing on the crowd. The Gordon riots have come down to us in images of smoke and fire, notes one historian. Perhaps nowhere is this more true than in Charles Dickens's novelistic account, Barnaby Rudge, 1841, subtitled A Tale of the Riots of 80, where we fairly hear the roar of the flames and the cracking of the timbers. Describing the reflections in every quarter of the sky of deep red soaring flames as though the last day had come and the whole universe were burning, Dickens informs us that it seemed as if the face of heaven were blotted out. Dickens writes that the vast throng that rampaged through the streets was composed for the most part of the very scum and refuse of London. Moreover, the mob raged and roared like a mad monster as it was, drawing on long-standing images of filthy, unkept vagrants. He portrays a gang of rebels covered with soot and dirt and dust and lime, their garments torn to rags, their hair hanging wildly about them. Behaving like hideous madmen, the, rubble, the rabble was driven by an unappeasable and maniac rage. A mob, proclaims Dickens, is usually a creature of very mysterious existence, particularly in a large city. The ocean is not more fickle and uncertain, more terrible when roused, more unreasonable, or more cruel. A moral plague ran through the city, he declares in invoking rhetorics of disease. The contagion spreads like a dread fever, an infectious madness. Seized on new victims every hour, and society began to tremble at their ravings. Dickens's description is intriguing not just for his anxious constructions of the monster mob, but also for the way he characterizes the rioters themselves. After all, if his reference to the scum and refuse of London is meant to, des to designate the unemployed, pickpockets, prostitutes, beggars, and thieves, then it is highly misleading about the social composition of the rioters. As George, Rude's, as George Ruday painstakingly demonstrated, the majority of those arrested during the Gordon riots were in fact employed laborers. Yet Dickens may be onto something in his intim intimation that many of the laboring poor shared much with the unemployed, irregular work, poverty, 
resort to crime to make ends meet, a defiant popular culture. Indeed, it is instructive that much of the drama of Dickens's novel re revolves around apprentices, among them Simon Tapperty, apprentice to a locksmith, precisely the group that astute observers of the time consider to have been in the forefront of the uprising. <clears throat> Lost my place. By the 18th century, apprenticeship had become more a form of semi-bonded labor for young workers than initiation into a lifelong trade. Masters and apprentices increasingly confronted one another across a class divide, rather than as members of a common profession. Appropriately, Dickens depicts a group of unruly apprentices shouting death to all masters, long live all apprentices, as he sets the stage for the riots. So separated is the world of the apprentices from that of the masters, that when Tapperty attends a meeting of the subversive apprentice knights, it is as if he has entered a foreign land, a space outside the geography of civilization. He is led through an obscure alley into a blind court of yard, profoundly dark, unpaved, and reeking with stagnant odors. Ominously, ominously, the ground seems to open at his feet, revealing a ragged head, and he is ushered into a meeting. In this resonant description, Dickens spatializes the class divide that racked London, contrasting its well-lit commercial and wealthy residential districts with dank, smelly back alleys and unlit courtyards. The riots themselves had roots in religious bigotry, originating in the agitation of Lord George Gordon against a bill that would have relaxed legal restrictions on Catholics. Yet as events unfolded and the action of the crowd became increasingly autonomous, the religious dimension receded and the movement's class character came to the fore. As Rude noted, there was no general attack on the Catholic community, the victims of the riots being distinguished by the fact they were, on the whole, persons of substance. Moreover, as the uprising shook off its primarily religious coloration, new strata of the, of the oppressed were drawn in, most notably segments of London, London's African population, many of whose members played leading roles in the popular movement. The event which most clearly defined the transition in the character of the riots, from being a purely anti-Catholic movement toward one based on a groping desire to settle accounts with the rich, if only for a day, occurred on June 6th, when the crowd, when the crowd turned its sights on Newgate Prison, arguably the most hated symbol of ruling class power in London. Smashing through gates and doors, destroying locks, the insurgents liberated hundreds of prisoners while setting the hated dungeon ablaze. Yet the destruction of Newgate merely fueled the crowd's hunger for revenge against loathed institutions. Again, Dickens captures something of the sentiment when an angry youth exclaims that the crowd must attack, not that jail alone, but every jail in London. And so, in fact, it did, sacking additional prisons and jails, along with other institutions of confinement. Twenty crimping houses, where impressed or forcibly conscripted sailors were held prior to setting out on ship. And private debtors' prisons, sponging houses. Among other things, these attacks involved an effort to smash open the closed structures, a bourgeois space, if agrarian capitalism in England centrally involved the enclosure of land, the whole of capitalism, rural and urban, entailed the spatial enclosure of property and the confinement of those who would violate it. Indeed, as we have seen, the enclosure of the rebel body of Jack Cade serves for Shakespeare to represent both the protection of property and the confinement of the transgressor. It is no accident then that the valiant master of Dickens's story is a locksmith whose apprentice joins the riots and pays with parts of his body, losing his legs when the soldiers repress the crowd. If social order is to be restored once again at the expense of proletarian bodies, then the regime of locks and keys must be preserved. As Linbaugh perceptively notes, the control of space is the essence of private property and its architecture became more complex. Yards, fences, railings, and gates formed an outer perimeter, 
stairwells, doors, rooms, and closets in inner one. Bureau, chests, cabinets, case, cases, desks, and drawers protected the articles of private property themselves. Each space was controlled by locks and access to each required a key. More than this, locks and keys were also, as they remain, key instruments for punishing those who transgressed the laws of property. To seize the keys of Newgate, as Francis Mockford did that historical June night in 1780, was to symbolically challenge the entire machinery of confinement that protected property and power. By brandishing them before the crowd, Mockford scorned the control of space upon which bourgeois property rests. Once more, albeit disapprovingly, Dickens astutely captures the sentiment of the insurgent crowd, their desire to de-enclose. The rebels, he writes, were breaking open inviolable drawers, putting things into their pockets which didn't belong to them, wantonly wasting, breaking, pulling down and tearing up nothing quiet, nothing private. As with Shakespeare, whatever Dickens's sympathies for the poor, he could not condone rebellion. Moreover, not only should his novel's rebels be punished, they must be publicly humiliated. And Dickens knew well the terms of punishment and ridicule, dismemberment. It is the fate of the locksmith's apprentice, Simon Tapperty, his legs having been crushed in the panic when soldiers opened fire on rioters to undergo amputation. Shorn of his graceful limbs, he henceforth ambles about London on two wooden legs, a theme Dickens repeats in Our Mutual Friend, where he again creates a character without legs, this time using anatomy to depict the working class monster as a multiracial hybrid of Indian, African, British, and animal parts. In Barnaby Jones, Dickens proceeds to ratchet up the index of humiliation, exploiting the phallic imagery available in dissection of legs to suggest castration and loss of manhood. We are informed in the final chapter that Tapperty's wife would mortify her husband by removing his legs in public places, thus exposing him to the ridicule of passers-by. In this image of woeful degradation, Dickens tames the riotous rabble. The rebel body is dissected and abased, thus transforming the mob that had terrified the bourgeoisie into an object of pity, an ugly but harmless, deformed monstrosity. But if the riotous monster of 1780 was tamed, it was only temporarily so. It would be only a matter of years before the terrifying rebel body would once again haunt the bourgeois imagination. Jacobins, Irishmen, and Luddites, rebel monsters in the age of Frankenstein. Perhaps no event so re-energized the discourse of monstrosity as did the French Revolution of 1789 to 99. Elite opinion in Britain was at first largely unperturbed by the French events, often seeing them as a, re as a replay of Britain's glorious revolution of 1688, in which, in which monarchs had been changed without a popular upheaval. But by 1792, ruling class opinion had shifted, coming over to the virulently anti-revolutionary sentiment of Edmund Burke. Two events in particular had driven the ruling circles into unremitting hostility to the French Revolution and its British supporters. First was the Second Revolution in France, the popular upheaval of 1792 that overthrew the monarchy and gave the impetus to radical forces allied to the Paris poor. Next was the appearance of Part Two of Thomas Paine's Rights of Man. If Part One from 1791 of Paine's work, with its attack on all forms of hereditary power, had been troubling. Part two was positively incendiary. In its proclamation that people naturally possessed economic as well as political rights, declaring that the poor had a right to public support in the forms of family allowances, maternity benefits, and old age pensions, and a decent standard of living, Paine opened a radical breach in the liberal doctrine of rights. The poor, he submitted, may demand economic support not as an appeal to charity, but as the exercise of a right. Given his commitments to market relations and private property, Paine probably did not appreciate all the radical implications of this claim. But a new generation of working class radicals did. In 
at the hands of theorists associated with the London Corresponding Society, LCS, Paine's message was extended and radicalized, pushed to the very borders of socialism. And a pervasive message it was. Historians estimate that 200,000 copies of part two of the rights of man were sold within a year. Weavers, shoemakers, miners, and others snatched up copies in Norwich, Manchester, Nottingham, Selby, Edinburgh, Oldham, and dozens of other localities. Meanwhile, recruitment to the militant LCS soared, sensing that they faced a burgeoning revolutionary movement. The authorities cracked down, charging radical activists with sedition, imprisoning some, transporting others. The Rights of Man was prosecuted in 1793, its author convicted in absentia of sedition. In May 1794, the government intensified its assault, suspending habeas corpus and arresting a series of writers and agitators. Momentarily knocked off balance, the radicals quickly regrouped when dearth and hunger ignited a new wave of protest the following year. More ominously for their rulers, radical speakers and writers began to deepen their critique of bourgeois private property. Under the influence of the likes of LCS leader John Thelwall, himself arrested in 1794, of the increasingly revolutionary Thomas Spence, publisher of the weekly Pig's Meat, and a former LCS secretary Thomas Evans, proto-socialist ideas found a growing audience. And such ideas were soon part of a revolutionary blend, as in the face of tightening repression, many activists began to discuss the merits of a British uprising allied with rebels in Ireland. It was in this context that the inflamed rhetoric of Burke's reflections on the revolution in France gained currency among Britain's rulers. While Burke's theoretical analysis was never fully embraced, his language of monstrosity was widely employed. In the first instance, Burke simply mobilized standard tropes about the monstrous mob, writing to his son in October 1789. He described the portentous state of France as one where the elements which compose human society seem all to be dissolved and a world of monsters to be produced in the place of it. His reflections continued in this vein, denouncing the monster of a constitution the revolutionaries had adopted, abusing the municipal army of Paris as a monster, and echoing a French politician who had described the French assembly as a species of political monster. But on top of these usages, Burke decisively innovated, appropriate, appropriating popular anxieties about grave robbing and dissecting into his counter-revolutionary discourse of monstrosity. Invoking the imagery of dissection, Burke extols that wise prejudice trampled by the Jacobin revolutionaries of France, which teaches people to look with horror on those children of their country who are prompt rashly to hack that aged parent into pieces. He then mixes the image with references to magic, alchemy, and resurrection, arguing that the murderous anatomizing children of France hope to put the dismembered patriarchal body into the kettle of magicians who seek, with the aid of wild incantations, to generate the body politic, exploiting images of evil spirits that shed old forms to reappear in different guises. He accuses the Jacobins of manufacturing new organs, which allow malevolent ghosts to transmigrate. Returning to the attack six years later in his widely read letter to a noble lord, Burke jostles together charges of cannibalism, sorcery, grave robbing, and alchemy. France is governed by legislative butchers under the influence of a cannibal philosophy, he exclaims. Never having raised his voice against the actual dissection of the poor, he seethed hatred for the sans-culotte carcass butchers, who ostensibly chop up the nobility into all sorts of pieces for roasting, boiling, and stewing. In addition to dissecting people, these deranged revolutionists also rob graves. Not even the sanctuary of the tomb is sacred, 
to those low enough to deny the departed the sad immunities of the grave. To top things off, these plebeian resurrectionists have brought forth evil spirits with their meddling in the graveyards. Out of the tomb of the murdered monarchy in France has arisen a vast, tremendous, unformed specter, he cries. Burke's attack on the French Revolution is significant for mobilizing plebeian anxieties about grave robbing and dissection on behalf of a rhetorically charged defense of the old order. In an important sense, the motifs of tombs and spirits he deploys situate his counter-revolutionary discourse in the Gothic tradition. In addition to portraying a world haunted by ghosts and phantoms, a central device of Gothic literature was the reversal of pursuer into pursued, a disorienting, horrifying inversion of the everyday world. And Burke, perhaps unconsciously, traces precisely such a reversal, albeit without the irony that pervaded the Gothic. He portrays a scene of horror in which the dissectors are themselves threatened with dissection. The result is an anxious, aristocratic, gothic shorn of irony, one that depicts a world under the sway of murder and mayhem. With the revolution in France, evil spirits have been unleashed, specters whose orgy of cannibalistic subversion threatens to devour both the living and the dead. Burke appears obsessed, a man who cannot sleep in the knowledge that our world is haunted by sinister forces. Cannibals, revolutionary anatomists, sacrilegious grave robbers, bent on total devastation. His Reflections is, in this respect, a gothic novel, a work whose author endures the unbearable awakeness of those who see and hear the ghosts, which others do not. But if Burke had mobilized popular idioms for anti-popular purposes, he was soon to discover that others could play this game of rhetorical reversal. His greatest intellectual adversary, Thomas Paine, did precisely this to great effect. In a single passage in Rights of Man, for instance, Paine serves up three aristocratic monsters in four sentences. He begins with claims for aristocratic cannibalism, pointing out that the feudal law of primogenitor required that all noble property descended to the firstborn male he pronounces that this amounts to disowning all other offspring. Aristocracy never had more than one child, he ever evers. The rest are begotten to be devoured. They are thrown to the cannibal for prey. In a deliberate provocation of Burke, he portrays the French revolutionaries as slayers of cannibal monsters. To restore, therefore, parents to their children and children to their parents, relations to each other and man to society, the French constitution has destroyed the law of primogenitorship. Here then lies the monster, and Mr. Burke, if he pleases, may write its epitaph. Having identified noble property as the real monster, Paine then extends the criticism to aristocracy in general. Whether we view it beforehand or behind or sideways or anywhere else, domestically or publicly, it is still a monster. Payne's contemporary, Mary Wollstonecraft, also Mary, Shelley, Mary Shelley's mother, similarly deployed the language of monstrosity in her attack on the Ancien Régime in France. Known today principally for her vindication of the rights of women from 1791, Wollstonecraft was also author of two works on the French Revolution, Vindication of the Rights of Man, 1790, and his subsequent more ambivalent set of reflections, An Historical and Moral View of the French Revolution, 1794. In the latter work, she exploits the rhetoric of monstrosity to anti-Burkean -Bur purposes. Describing the old order in France as a degenerate body politic rife with monstrous excess and vice, she condemns its nocturnal orgies, flatigious immorality, sickly appetites, and atrocious debaucheries, while accusing it of despotism and butcheries. All of these, she asserts, are nothing more than the excrescences of a giant <laughs> excrescences of a gigantic tyranny, the result of the demon of despotism.
Distancing herself from the violence of the revolutionary mob, Wollstonecraft assigns responsibility for their excesses to the old order. By dulling the mind and corrupting manners, French despotism had produced two degener degenerate types, the devouring beast and the spiritless reptile. The excesses of the French terror are thus reflex reflexes of an ancien regime that engaged in dissection and murder, cutting off the heads or torturing the bodies of its opponents, dabbling in sanguinary tortures, insidious poisonings and dark assassinations, the rulers of France inevitably metamorphosed into a race of monsters in human shape. In the same vein, in his influential inquiry concerning political justice, William Godwin opined that all systems of hereditary property and power comprised a ferocious monster, one expert at devouring all authentic human attributes and virtues. Burke thus encountered in Payne and Wollstonecraft two literary radicals as adept as he, ha he at deploying the language of monstrosity. But whereas the rights of man appeared before Jacobin dominance and thus avoided the problem of the revolutionary terror, Wollstonecraft's 1794 work responded by extending the analysis of monstrosity to the oppressed classes arguing that despotism produced grotesque effects among the downtrodden. Since people are a product of circumstances, the lower orders of France, deprived of civil and political rights, were inevitably corrupted. By dividing society into separate orders, one tyrannizing the other, the old regime sundered ties of affection, sullied human dignity and blunted the moral sentiments. The result was two monstrosities, domineering tyrants on one side, a class of slaves who felt no moral obligations to their rulers on the other. If the rule of the former is always barbaric, the retaliation of slaves is always terrible. <clears throat> Yet, while the system of despotism is ultimately responsible for the frightening retaliation of slaves, a theme embraced by her daughter, Mary Shelley, this does not reduce the horror of the latter's violence. And this dilemma, this dialectic of monstrosity, would reappear across the greatest of English Jacobin novels, Frankenstein among them. It was Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, author of Political Justice, 1793, who composed the most successful English Jacobin novel during the Revolutionary Era. The term Jacobin is, however, something of a misnomer, a term largely applied to these British reformers by their opponents. Godwin, Wollstonecraft, and their associates certainly supported the French Revolution. They defended Thomas Paine and proudly declared themselves advocates of the rights of man. But unlike many plebeian radicals, they were not revolutionary by temperament or association, favoring literary work over political organizing. Contrary to Jacobinism, they rejected violence and embraced a progressive gradualism. As Godwin put it in Political Justice, progress should take place in a mild and gradual, though incessant advance, not by violent leaps. While these writers and dissenting ministers from the educated middle class tended toward republicanism, they feared the excesses of the crowd. Intellectual enlightenment was their work, not political agitation and mobilization. And to this end, they produced, particularly during the 1790s, a string of novels that sought to advance the cause of intelligent social reform. The most noteworthy of these so-called Jacobin novels was Godwin's Things As They Are, or The Adventures of Caleb Williams, 1794. This highly influential work spawned a tradition of early 19th century Godwinian novels. A stylistic innovator, Godwin, de design Godwin designed a confessional novel that utilized a number of Gothic conventions, particularly the doublings and reversals between pursuer and pursued that disturbed the reader's sympathies with either of the lead characters. In so doing, he put into question the social circumstances that generated these characters, their motivations and their behaviors. The result was a sort of radical Gothic that mobilized characters of psychological complexity caught in a perplexing whirl of intrigue and suspense.
Central to Caleb Williams are problems of property, law, and class, embodied particularly in relations between masters and servants. Indeed, one especially powerful scene brings all three of these together by portraying a lord's persecution of a tenant under the Black Act, a section of which is quoted in order to expose its extraordinary repressive character. At the center of the story is the persecution of Caleb Williams, falsely accused of theft by his lord, master, employer, Ferdinando Falkland, because he has divined the murderous secret the latter conceals. Having pursued the truth about his master, Williams himself is soon pursued by his employer, the courts, and a variety of bounty hunters. The dynamics of the novel revolve around the reversals and doublings that characterize the relationship between Falkland and Williams. Godwin shows us how each is a captive of his social role and of the other. As much as they alternately pursue and flee, they are bound together in a fateful venture. At the same time, the class divide destroys each. Indeed, we can read Godwin as tracing a whole series of effects of political anatomy of the partitioning of society. For the socially weaker party, Caleb Williams, the results are especially devastating. Young, intelligent, and resourceful, though he may be, he is no match for the power of money supported by the law. Consequently, he must hide from virtually all of humankind in order to avoid arrest imprisonment, and a probable death sentence. In reciting his enforced detachment from society, Williams employs the language of dissection, describing himself as a solitary being cut off from the expectation of sympathy, as a person cut off from the whole human species, and as cut off from the friendship of mankind. Once on the run, Williams adopts a series of disguises adapted from marginalized outsiders. Choosing to blend in with outcasts from respectable society, he appears at different times as a beggar, a Jew, and an Irishman. In short, he assumes the forms of various monsters that threatened bourgeois sensibility. The transformation of the oppressed outcast into a grotesque being is arguably the most important Godwinian theme taken up and radicalized in Frankenstein. The monsterization of the Irish, one of the peoples whose identity Caleb Williams adopts, was particularly significant in the era of Frankenstein. England's first colony, Ireland, had been subjected to the rigors of political anatomy, its lands expropriated, mapped, and partitioned. As part of the, the legitimation strategy entwined with this project, the Irish were racialized, depicted as a violent, disorderly, and uncivilized breed. In fact, in his, prov in his provocatively titled Political Anatomy of Ireland, 1672, William Petty had described Ireland as a political animal susceptible to anatomization of the sort carried out on common animals. The Irish were rebel monsters in every sense. At home, they plotted insurrection, never more dangerously than in 1798, when the United Irishmen made common cause with revolutionary France in its war with Britain. The fact that many English Pen Penites had extensive personal and political connections with Ireland and its rebel movement only increased their notoriety. notoriety. And the Godwins and the Shelleys were among the most notorious in this regard. Daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin, Mary Shelley shared this notoriety. Not only was Mary Wollstonecraft, hold on. Not only was Mary Wollstonecraft's mother Irish, but Godwin had dined with Irish Republicans, including Colonel Despard and Robert Emmett, both of whom went to the gallows in 1803. And these associations had directly domestic consequences in England. The Irish, after all, were more than an external enemy inside England as migrant laborers. They constituted a tumultuous core of the unruly mob. For their efforts, they figured prominently among the London hanged. In a context of established anti-Irish ideology, one indicator of Mary Shelley's radical alignments and those of her partner and husband, the poet, the poet, fuck, the poet Percy Shelley, is their sustained commitment to the cause of Irish freedom.
In addition to consorting with Jacobins, this daughter of Godwin and Wollstonecraft was also suspect for her alignments with the monstrous Irish. One further beast featured decisively in forming the political context for Frankenstein, Ludism, a movement without a central leadership or overarching organizational structure Ludism terrified the British ruling class across the years 1811 to 17. Erupting, quickly subsiding, then surging forward again, the Ludite movement constituted a heroic insurgency against the consolidation of industrial capitalism, particularly in the woolen industry. Throughout this industry and many others, work reorganization was displacing much human labor and rendering what remained a mere appendage of a, of a mechanized production system. While generally identified with machine breaking, which did indeed figure centrally, ludism was a multifaceted response to the manifold ways in which labor was being devalued, mechanized, cheapened, and more thoroughly subordinated to capital. In addition to attacks on machines, ludites also organized food riots and armed uprisings. The movement peaked in April 1812 as riots swept towns and cities across Lanc Lancashire, Yorkshire, Cheshire, and Derbyshire, including centres like Manchester, Coventry, Birming Birmingham, and Sheffield. These few days, observes one historian, had seen the sim simultaneous insurrections of populations of working class on a scale England had never before experienced. Larger and larger groups of weavers, croppers, cotton printers, colliers, and other workmen meeting no longer in hidden places, put on open moorland in near towns, some in gangs of several hundreds, were being reported from every one of the northern manufacturing towns. According to one recent estimate, Ludites destroyed over 100,000 pounds worth of property between 1811 and 1813. 1,200 stocking frames in the Nottingham area, at least 200 shearing frames in gig mills, the entirety of two factories in Lancashire and Cheshire, two large houses which were burned to the ground and untold amounts of cloth. The sight of smoldering factories testified to the eruption of a full-fledged class war, as did the response of the ruling class. With capitalist property besieged, England's rulers turned to class terror. Fully 35,000 armed men were sent into the rebel areas. Shooting, maiming, arresting, and imprisoning, these troops re-established bourgeois order. By the end of 1813, well before the movement's final battles, probably three dozen workers had been killed, 24 sent to the gallows, and 51 sentenced to Australia. Of the 21 men and one woman condemned to hang by special commissions in Ches Chester and Lancaster in June 1812, three received the death penalty for having stolen bread, cheese, and potatoes, a reminder that property took precedence over life. Coordinated repression on this scale required unprecedented efforts to install military force throughout the country. To this end, the year 1812 saw barracks built for 138,000 soldiers in London and for over 160,000 in Liverpool, Bristol, and Brighton combined. If English liberalism had once prided itself on the absence of a standing army, threats to capitalist authority induced a new conceit, converting men of property to the virtues of an overweening military presence. The Ludite revolts and the repression they induced are pivotal to the context in which Frankenstein took shape. The book originated in a ghost story contest between Percy Shelley, the poet Lord George Byron, his physician John Polidori, author of the first published vampire tale in English, and Mary Shelley as they spent the summer of 1816 together outside Geneva. There can be little doubt that repression of the Ludites arose in the group's conversations that summer. Byron himself had eloquently denounced state violence against the rebels in his maiden speech in the House of Lords in February 1812, attacking Tory proposals to apply the death penalty to machine breaking. Challenging the Lords to forsake repression, he declared, 
All the cities you have taken, all the armies that have retreated before your leaders are but paltry subjects of self-congratulation, if your land divides against itself, and your dragoons and executioners must be let loose against your fellow citizens. You call these men a mob. It is the mob that labor in your fields, serve in your houses, that man your navy and recruit your army, that have enabled you to defy all the world, and can also defy you when neglect and calamity have driven them to despair. Percy Shelley too had rallied against anti-Ludite repression, participating with his then wife Harriet in fundraising efforts for the families of 14 Ludite men executed in 1813. For Byron and Shelley, as for all radicals of the period, the Ludites, whatever their errors, were victims of a reactionary anti-democratic ruling class that sanctified the rights of property above all others. While the Godwinian radicals, unlike their plebeian counterparts, recoiled from Ludite violence, they nonetheless blamed the tyranny of Britain's rulers for the desperate revolts of the many-headed multitude. Perhaps equally significant, they in they identified the drive for accumulation at the expense of human well-being as an inherent feature of Britain's anti-democracy, thus opening the way for a critique of property relations. So warped were the values of England's rulers, Byron had proclaimed in his famous speech that they were prepared to see men's, men sacrificed to improvements in mechanism. For radical liberals of the Wollstonecraft Godwin variety, Ludite revolt and government repression were merely different symptoms of the sickness inherent in Britain's system of monarchy, arist aristocracy, and rule of the property. Class and civil war, violence, and repression were predictable outgrowths of an authoritarian Ossian regime. Jacobin terror, Irish insurrectionism, Ludite uprisings may all have been terrifying, but as Wollstonecraft had warned, they were the inevitable horrors produced by a grotesque system of oppression. These themes cannot have been far from Mary Shelley's mind while she worked on Frankenstein. After all, her novel can be said to revolve around the plight of a land that divides against itself, one in which people are sacrificed to improvements in mechanism. Moreover, by figuring the creation of the proletariat in the idioms of grave, grave robbing and dissection, Frankenstein constituted a horror story in which class oppression was registered in the language of political anatomy. Uh, the monstrosities of the market were thus subtly deciphered through the horrific lectures read upon working class bodies and minds by nascent capitalism. Such considerations would only have been reinforced by the hanging of yet more Ludite rebels in April 1817 as she was making final revisions to her manuscript.